The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Cedar. It is Monday, May 7th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Aziz Rana, author of The Two Faces of American Freedom, professor at Cornell Law School on the left's missing foreign policy. Also on the program today, the White House hired Israeli spies to entrap former Obama officials in order to destroy the credibility of the Iran deal. Not a joke. That's effed up. I can't, I honestly can't get past that. Gina Haspel is, uh, her history of torture has her a little bit worried about her Wednesday hearings. Republicans are ready to midwife Robert Mueller's firing and Don Blankenship surges. Imagine that, despite all of the the racism and nasty talk, he's actually doing better amongst Republicans. Hmm. West Virginia primary is tomorrow. And as, uh, meanwhile, uh, Elaine Chow's China family may have some ethics problems. Silver alert. If anyone's seen Rudy Giuliani walking the streets of New York, please dial 311. And a record number of women are running for House and Senate seats. And lastly, how does Scott Pruitt still have a job? All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, So, folks, uh, here is a programming note. The the interview today uh, I recorded, uh, well, I guess it was last week, but it was in response. Um, We spoke to, I guess it was a week ago, Andrew Basevich. And um, we discussed with him a lot of foreign policy questions, particularly the use of the military. And... Uh, One of the questions I asked him at the end was, do we need a left foreign policy? Can we even uh, can we speak about an alternate uh, foreign policy in that context? And he said, yeah, we certainly do. And uh, the gist of his piece in large uh, part is that both parties have failed to um, to really question some of the central premises that have driven our foreign policy for an extended period of time. So uh, the idea is today get Aziz Rana on. And we spoke to him, I guess it was a couple of months ago, about um, his piece about, what was it, Brendan? The, foreign, the, uh, the Cold War is over or what, what? Goodbye, Cold War. Goodbye, Cold War. So uh, that should be interesting. And we should tell you that today, uh, well, first let me say this. Harry's knows that a great shave comes down to great blades. And they make their, sh- uh, their, their blades with sharp, durable steel that lasts. They will even give you a full refund if you do not love your shave. You just got to let them know within 30 days. Now, folks, I am, I am unshaven today. But if I get a call, I really only shave now just, just to go on television. Or if it's like getting so much that I know that if I shave later, it's going to be painful. But when I do shave... It's with Harry's. They stand behind the quality of their blades. They created a $13 trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. You get the weighted ergonomic handle. You get the five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and the trimmer blade, or what we call around here, something to deal with Sam's uh, nostrils. I'm not going to go into it, but um, astute people know that my nostrils are not uh, symmetric. And it's just one of those things that I I had done so that I didn't look too perfect on camera. Because you always want a flaw to allow people to, it's like a door into like you. Adrian Brody and Owen Wilson. Yeah, exactly. That is exactly right. Just like those guys. Um, 
and rich lathering shave gel, a travel blade cover. You can claim yours by going to harrys.com slash majority report. You know what I love best about Harry's? Inexpensive, great shave, and I like the handle. I mean, if you don't if you don't know that I, I like Harry's basically sponsored. Well, not technically. I guess I don't want to say that. That might be an idea. They could actually sponsor every time I go on to um, on to cable news, like just wear a little lapel <laughs> lapel pin or something. Now our listeners can redeem their trial set at Harry's dot com slash majority report. Make sure you go to Harry's dot com slash majority report to redeem your offer. Let them know I sent you to help support the show, folks. That's harrys.com slash majority report. Also, let me ask you this. When you shop online, do you you shop online a lot? Yeah, probably too much. Do you, do you have, are you like a tab hoarder? Do you end up like having 14 tabs open? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. I am. And I am. I have I have mentioned this in the past. You load dozens and dozens of new tabs on your browser in search of what a promo code. This is a, the, like literally this is one thing I feel like I've passed on to Mila. You're afraid to close any of them in fear of missing out on a deal before you crash your browser yet again. Try Honey. It's the free browser add-on that over nine million people are using every day to save money while they shop online. I mean, this is one of the things like. This is one of the few things that Milo's ever listened to me about. I was like, dude, if you're buying stuff online, you got to go search for a uh, a coupon code. But yes, it is a little bit of like, uh, it is, it's like, you're like 49ing it. You're, you're going out there finding, you know, you've got your pan handle and you're shaking the sand. All right. Sort of like computer doing the coupons for you. Well, yeah, exactly. In two clicks, you add honey to your browser for free. Then you shop like you normally would, and instead of opening up 25 browsers trying to find a coupon that works, this one says 52%. Maybe it'll work. Nope. Boom. Okay, let me go back to the other one. 73%. Did it work? Nope. Not. Boom. Honey scans and tests millions of coupons, then automatically applies the best one at checkout. Time Magazine calls Honey basically free money. You're leaving money on the table, folks. I don't like to do that at all. Check it out. I don't know if it, I, I'm trying to think if I did it for her Brandy Melville thing. Maybe one time, but certainly, certainly nothing that uh, my daughter has ever gotten didn't first come from me searching for a coupon and now uh, just because it's automatically applied because of Honey. There's no reason not to add Honey to your browser today. It's free. It takes just two clicks to install. It will save you tons of money. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash majority. That's two words. Join honey.com slash majority. That's more than that's more than two words. But join honey. Oh, the, the, the actual site is joinhoney.com slash majority. You can start saving money today with honey. That's joinhoney.com slash majority. All right, folks. Uh, so here's the deal. Uh, today and tomorrow we are redoing our our set. You'll notice it. It won't be, it won't be, it's going to be dramatic just in terms of the quality. It's not going to be a radical overhaul. It's just going to be a, an upgrade. And we're going to, the, the plan is to have a, a wide shot, which is uh, apparently very important in the show business. Um, but uh, so we're going to be, um, we're not going to have a, a, a fun half today. And uh, tomorrow we will also be pre taped. Uh, but let's take a quick break. When we come back, Aziz Rana on the left's missing foreign policy. And just a reminder, it is your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. We, uh, we always need your support. All right, quick break, Aziz Rana. Oh, the man she made 
Yeah. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report, on the phone. It is a, ple- a pleasure to welcome back to the program Professor of Law at Cornell University, Aziz Rana. Aziz, the last time we had you on the program, it was uh, to talk about your piece, Goodbye Cold War. And this is, um, I don't know if this is the sequel, uh, but it is uh, another piece in N Plus One mag entitled The Left's Foreign Pol- uh, Missing Foreign Policy. Welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for having me on. All right. So you start, and this is sort of tied into the 15-year the anniversary of the start of the occupation and invasion of Iraq, uh, which was, of course, in March. Uh, and you start your piece talking uh, or reminiscing, I guess, about conversations you had in 2003 and the run-up uh, to the war and the um, the... I guess the the lack of contrast or serious contrast or debate about the invasion of Iraq. Just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, you know, I just graduated from college um, when sort of the lead up to the Iraq war took place. And the thing that was really striking about it was that it was a moment of mass global mobilization against the war effort on the streets in the major cities in the U.S. across the world. But inside D.C., in the Beltway, and if you were to talk to Democratic politicians and many of the national security experts and officials that circulated around those politicians, it's surprising how little of that kind of popular opposition really, you know, infiltrated. And so, you know, the, the way that I begin the piece is I, uh, I was having a conversation at that time with a professor of mine that I had a ton of respect for. And he was just really um, upset, not only by the kind of insanity of the Bush administration's push for war, but the fact that many people that he thought of as friends and, you know, good-thinking liberals seemed to defend the war as well. And that was actually a lot of my own experience, where I had classmates in college that I thought of, oh, you know, these are good sort of left-leaning folks um, who believed uh, Colin Powell's speech to the UN and thought that the U.S. had to a responsibility to get rid of a rogue actor, and just because it's George W. Bush that's engaged in in the act, you should just hold your nose and support the policy anyway. And it was a kind of remarkable moment where large segments of the Democratic Party's foreign policy establishment, um, from not just Hillary Clinton, from Clinton to Biden to Samantha Power to you know a number of the, the sort of the intellectual heavyweights that whose names might not be familiar but ended up staffing significant positions in the Obama administration, all backed the war. And to me, that last point is the key one, because their support did not en- end up undermining their capacity to come back to power with Obama. And that, I think, tells us something really important about the limitations of the Obama years. And it speaks to a worry that I have even today, 15 years later, which is there still hasn't been a reckoning within the party itself about the decisions that its leaders made back then. How how much of this? I mean, I um, I I, your assessment tracks with what I uh, experienced at the time. And um, and and I was probably doing I guess it was within a year I was on the radio uh, talking about the war. But in, in the run up to the war as well, I was involved in some measure of, of activism in media um, uh, speaking out against it. I mean, I'm struck by and it, it doesn't necessarily um, in any way impact. Well, it doesn't uh, particularly implicate your argument, but one of the elements, it seems to me, was this sort of um, there was a a lot of fear, it seems to me, involved in the Democratic and even I would say just broadly speaking, the left. Um, and and I'm, I'm speaking very broadly when I say the left um, uh, fear of 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 dissent uh, as a function of the sort of close proximity in time to 9-11. I mean, we first bombed in 2003, but in February. So we're really only like 16 months away from uh, 9-11 at that point. And the um, there was, y- y- you know, you didn't have the opportunity or I should say there was a lot of people afraid of espousing a a contradictory opinion 
with that said, I think there was also, I mean, I think this is also indicative, and you get into the piece more about this, and I want to I want to get your take on this, that there is, in some ways, an absence, and there has been an absence of foreign policy principles on the, again, broadly speaking, the left for decades, it seems to me. Like, there has been no articulable um, foreign policy from the Democrats other than we're going to just play defense relative to what the, the Republicans are doing. Yeah, a few things. So I think you're absolutely right to say that the proximity to 9-11 um, made the politics of dissent uh, really complicated. I mean, this is also a period where to criticize American counterterrorism policy uh, and especially the treatment of Muslims and Muslim Americans was very difficult. So this is a different kind of era than the one that we're experiencing now. But, you know, at the same time, that doesn't explain the fact that you had a lot of people that claim progressive credentials that weren't just sort of silent or quiet or engaged in a kind of pragmatic decision not to voice dissent, but that were just ringleaders. They were yeah. raw, raw defenders of the war. Um, so I'm going to mention Biden because... You know, Biden, his name comes up as somebody that thinks that he should have run in 2016. Maybe he'd be president. Maybe he should run in 2020. But, you know, he went out of his way to defend Colin Powell's speech as like one of the great speeches before the U.N. When the war started going bad, his response was not to rethink his avid support for it, but to say, well, the U.S. should now be in the business of partitioning Iraq on sectarian terms, an utterly right. destructive policy. And he was one of a number of people um, that wholeheartedly backed the war across the mainstream media. So in the Times, in the liberal magazines, in the New Yorker, in the, um, in the New Republic, in the elected leadership of the party, among intellectuals um, that continue to have uh, you know, a significant perch like Fried Zakaria. Um, so there's something that has to be addressed with that. And then I think you're, you're right about the bigger point, which is there's a long history about why um, Democrats in particular have been hesitant to critique the policies of the national security state. And this has to do with a tendency going all the way back to the beginning of the Cold War to really separate between foreign and domestic and to run, run afraid, basically, of being rebated in various ways. And, and I think, if you'd like, we can talk a little bit about that history because it I has two significant moments I want the to go in post World War II period and then the Vietnam period. I, I want to go into that in a moment, but let me just let me just uh, backtrack to to the sort of the Biden Fareed Zakaria. Uh, I mean, God help us! I'd put Thomas Friedman in this um, uh, category. I mean, because I I think I mean I happen to think that more than anyone else, uh, Thomas Friedman influenced the sort of like center left and gave license. And, and all three of them uh, were supporters of the war. And, you, you know, and then you get, you know, you get the Beinarts um, and you, you get a whole the, you, you run the gamut. The interesting thing is that each of them had a different sort of like slightly unique reason for supporting the war as if so that they could align with they could align with um, uh, uh, Bush, but also have some discrepancy. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of their policies, like uh, we end up at the same place, but it, but we've got to, um, you know, but I'm doing it for a different reason. I mean, I think, you know, Thomas Friedman was like, I, I I'm doing it because of uh, democracy or, you know, everybody had a slightly different reason. Uh, and in fact, Wolfowitz famously said, you know, weapons of mass destruction was just a thing that we could all agree on. So we had a single talking point, essentially. But there's also. Uh, oh, can I. Go ahead. Yeah, could I just make a you yeah. know, just a, a little point about this? Is and it tells us something that was really key about the conversation in D.C. and within the Democratic Party at that time, which is this was a conversation. I get to, into it in the piece that wasn't really a critique of you know the big picture tendencies of American foreign policy, the focus on um, the legitimacy of American international police power and the right to intervene in near continuous basis and reconstructing other states. It was a pragmatic disagreement about whether or not Iraq was the right choice. Right. And the nature of that really constrained disagreement meant that even the supporters could back the war for different pragmatic reasons. Getting rid of a rogue actor, um, humanitarian concerns about Iraq, the, the, you know, the Iraqi pu uh, public, the question about 
weapons. And it meant then that when things went really sour, all of them have either rewritten history to, to emphasize how they were less supportive than they might appear, or to say, you know, ultimately the blame is on the Bush administration. The blame is not on me because of how poorly the war itself was implemented. And I think that has a lot to do with, um, you know, sort of the, the consequences of how people remember the war. And all right, so, but let me also bring up another case of a guy like John Kerry, who I think at one time, right? I mean, because he was against the first incursion into Iraq, um, who I think at his core, you know, to the extent that he had articulated um, uh, foreign policy principles leading up to then, and, and I agree with you, I don't know that we've ever had a major Democratic figure, at least in my lifetime, or eh, maybe, let's say, just the past three, three or four decades, uh, who has articulated a a foreign policy that has questioned these underlying assumptions uh, that you're talking about? Like it's perf- you know, it's just a question of which which place we go in and intervene, as opposed to the idea that we have a right to intervene. Uh, but but John Kerry was pretty close. I mean, he was um, very strong when it came to that uh, first incursion in Iraq. He was very strong with what we were doing in uh, Latin America. Um, he also obviously spoke out um, uh, about uh, against Vietnam. I don't know if he ever articulated a questioning of that basic assumption, but uh, this is a guy who basically it was pure political expediency in in 2003 when he votes uh, for the Iraq war uh, at that point um, or, you know, the parsing out what authorization he had he had given. Um, but yes, everybody had to t- speak tough. And, and part of it was also, you know, uh, Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton had, uh, imposed sort of very brutal sanction regime against, um, uh, Saddam and it had, it had really hurt the Iraqi people. And so there was more, the attitude was still there, I guess. Uh, but, but, but speak to, that uh, those issues as to why that history of the Democratic Party being sort of, um, I don't know, a just sort of passive, I guess, when it comes to sort of formulating a foreign policy. So I think that there's a historical argument and then there's an argument from the contemporary moment about how how expertise and national security expertise has been treated. Um, The historical argument is, again, about two moments in time. The, the period right after World War II and the early days of the Cold War, and then the period in the context of Vietnam. What happens in the early days of the Cold War, and this is con- connects to the conversation we had last time I was on the show, is that foreign policy becomes part of the bargain that labor, business, and state engage in, in, in terms of trying to think of a way of institutionalizing the New Deal and moving past the conflicts that really marked the 30s and the period before World War II. And one thing that I think is really important to remember is that the civil rights um, uh, activists, civil rights movement, and especially the labor movement, were deeply internationalist. In other words, both movements had very strong ideas of their own independent foreign policy distinct from whatever the state was saying. Because the labor movement's position had been, well, the state represents business, and we can't just have the same foreign policy as what the state says. And as part of this labor business state bargain that takes place, in the 40s, you have a move by labor leaders to essentially say as a condition of ensuring that our domestic labor protections are entrenched, we're no longer going to be in the business of questioning the prerogatives of the state. And in fact, you have leaders in the movement like Walter Ruther who see this as a good reason to strongly back the kind of anti-communist purges that clear out large chunks of the movement. And it leaves a really long legacy for what you can think of as social democratic politics in the country, the New Dealers and their descendants, which is the belief that, you know, social democracy is about a domestic project of preserving the the welfare state. It's not about what the U.S. is in the business of promoting abroad. And indeed, if if labor movement activists oppose what the U.S. is doing abroad, it's going to hurt their position um, internally, and it's going to lead to being called, you know, a fifth column or communist sympathizers or being red baited. 
So that, that's, I think, a key development. And then there's a, a second moment that takes place in the context of Vietnam. Do you, do you want me to talk about that? Or Please, we, yes, uh, yes. Pause for a second. The second moment that happens with Vietnam is that, you know, this, you know, early Cold War compromise ends up really failing. And it fails pretty obviously in Vietnam, where the, the labor movement and the union leadership in particular um, tacitly backs the war. Their own base over time comes increasingly to oppose it, and it produces massive um, uh, social crisis, dislocation, and questioning about really like the terms of the post-war order. And and, and I would also that, say I would also say the sort of the the acquiescence, the sort of like the the lack of 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 meaningful engagement also leads to the actual catastrophe of itself. I mean, never mind what the, the political implications. I'm convinced that the absence of another voice in the room, you know, ends up in disaster in all sorts of, uh, of enterprises, you, particularly in this one. Yeah, you don't, you don't have those voices saying, hey, this is, this is a bad idea. Right, we should think twice advance. about this. And maybe yeah. somebody else goes, hey. eh, it's possible, actually. It is a bad idea. Exactly. And then you also have all of the money that's basically being thrown away on a war that's morally disastrous and utterly destructive of, of human life for Americans, but, you know, the millions of Vietnamese that are being killed. I mean, that undermines the kind of resources that are available domestically to pursue precisely the social democratic goals that the, the unions might have. But what it does is it, it creates space for a sustained and really radical conversation about what the ends of the security state should be and whether or not the Cold War, not just Vietnam, but the Cold War's priorities need to be rethought. And the figure, frankly, that ends up coming to embody this in many ways um, isn't just the anti-war candidates of 68, but McGovern in 72. And that conversation leads to policies that I think are really important policies from the early mid 70s. So the war powers resolution that attempts to constrain the ability of the president to unilaterally pursue war, the church committee that looks into all of the various um, war crimes and kind of violations of international law that the U.S. engaged in through its intelligence operations. But McGovern's campaign in 72 is a massive defeat. And it's defeat on just these grounds, because what Nixon does is he's not just running on like, you know, um, I'm going to I'm going to bring peace, but peace with honor, peace with dignity. But he has a 72 campaign and a convention that's all about the flag, all about just wrapping himself in Cold War patriotism. And I think the lesson for the new generation of Democrats, so um, the Gary Hart's of the world, um, the even the, the Carters of the world, and then later on, people like Bill and eventually Hillary Clinton, is that, you know, basically running against national security imperatives is an absolute dead end. It's one of the ways that I read Bill Clinton's 92 campaign slogan or statement, it's the economy, stupid. Right. So we tend to think of this as, oh, this is about like, you know, the pragmatism on fo focusing on people's like bread and butter needs. Yes. But it's also, in a way, encapsulating a larger uh, worldview that says, what is it that left-leaning or liberal politicians should do if they want to get elected? They should cleave domestic and foreign, leave foreign to a bipartisan national security expertise establishment, and just focus on like micro needs of specific constituencies. And those two kind of historical developments meant that even well past when the public would actually vote you out because of your because you're seen as like soft on national security, there's just a presumption that that's not what a quote unquote progressive candidate should do. You just don't worry about that. Focus on the economic stuff because there are real pragmatic and political costs for doing so. And 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 I would say, I mean, you know, we saw an example of this to some extent with with Bernie Sanders. In I mean, and and to be fair. I think when he entered the race and for an extended period of time during his campaign, he perceived himself as a message candidate uh, who was there to deliver an economic um, uh, an economic message. But it is the case that uh, even through those years, he had no foreign policy shop. 
<laughs> and I mean, yeah. he's, he's built one now. Um, but, but he had nothing on the campaign. And part of the reason why he had nothing on the campaign was also because in his 30 some odd years as a lawmaker or less, uh, he, he had never, he had no advisors, um, you know, no close, meaningful advisors. It's just not a terrain that he was interested in slash. I mean, he, I think he had interest, but it was just not where he thought, uh, his work was going to be done. And, you know, I'll say like even, uh, myself to the extent that, uh, when I, uh, uh, programmatically, it's not, it's not exactly uh, analogous, but programmatically, uh, it's much easier on the, uh, the left to have ignored these topics on some level. Yeah. I mean, so I think, so we shouldn't overstate it. I mean, so he, there's the, there's his history in the eighties in terms of, um, politics engagement with what was going on in Nicaragua very, and the U.S.'s dirty wars in, very in Latin America. In right. Yeah. There, there's his statement during the campaign that was, you know, what, one of, I think, uh, the most stirring statements he gave, which was, you know, Henry Kissinger's no friend of mine. Yep. There was the obvious background sense that he was, of all of the candidates, certainly Trump included, the truly authentic anti-war candidate. So there was a way in which a critique was there in the background. And even, of course, his self-conscious use of socialists, democratic socialists to describe himself was a rejection of this kind of Cold War red baiting, say that yes. you can't red bait us anymore. So all of this is important, but there was no infrastructure when it comes to the bread and butter of policy. Yes. And to me, this gets to the second point about expertise. Like one of the things that's, that's really remarkable about, let's say, the 70s up until um, the last couple of years is that there was a kind of, um, you, you know, the, the word that comes to mind is uh, hegemonic or single or unified position on economic matters and on national security matters. So that, that to understand the economy required a particular kind of expertise that's bound to how economics is taught in American universities that leads to particular individuals just having a better sense of complex questions that are really beyond what ordinary people can understand. And then there was a similar view about national security that was tied to how massive the state is and how much information is secret. In other words, you could say whatever you want about, oh, this is a bad policy or this threat is being exaggerated, but the immediate response is, well, folks just have information that you don't. Right. And they have a kind of facility with this secret information that if only you knew what the president gets in his presidential briefings, you'd have a very different less naive approach to the world. And in a way, the thing that exposed both of those positions were the great crises of the first decade of the 20th century, uh, 21st century, excuse me, the financial crisis and the Iraq war, which made clear that, you know, the national security establishment first doesn't seem to have information that's any different than what's available to to folks through like the pu public domain, and they're interpreting it in ways that are really problematic. Right, and, and even the if, financial crisis. Even ahead. if they have different information, it doesn't seem to be helpful in any way. <laughs> no, and right. and with the financial crisis, like all these economists um, have essentially led the, the the world to the brink of global financial ruin. Now, what's noteworthy is that the first couple years of the Obama administration on the economic side, that didn't really make any difference. Guess who's back in charge of economic decisions? That same group of uh, economists and, and business actors, highlighted by somebody like Larry Summers. Um, what shifted things was Occupy, and then eventually over time, Occupy leading through a series of steps to, to the Sanders campaign. So it was politics that raised the issue about the fact that these experts shouldn't be the ones that have a stranglehold on economic decisions. Right. But there was never an equivalent moment, really, when it comes to foreign policy. So that we have social movements over the last few years, like Movement for Black Lives, or even the Democratic Socialists of America and some of their convention statements that have been pushing a critique of empire, really to the center of their own politics. But it hasn't linked to an, an effort in electoral democratic politics to say, well, actually, w wait a second, this, this bipartisan expertise is a house of cards. 
I, and I want to get uh, off on too much of a tangent here, too, but it w- it's interesting. You can see this in the context of of the the sort of the the never Trumper and the resistance movement. Um, you the 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 any sins that involve foreign policy, right, have been completely forgiven and ignored. Uh, so you know, Bill Crystal, David Frum, um, uh, these characters, um, they they can come, ho- you know, they can they can speak uh, against a Donald Trump, but there's no reckoning for their uh, what they did in 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 terms of Iraq. Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think it's the the lack of a conversation in 2016 that was a pointed substantive debate about the U.S.'s security state policies allowed all of these folks to get rehabilitated by um, by sort of left of center um, mainstream media and then sort of the, the public more generally. And to me, this is the complicated nature of the Russia investigation, because I would add Mueller here. So my own view about the Russia investigation is that it's, and this is what I also stated in the piece, I think it's really important. We should know if a foreign government was involved in influencing domestic public opinion, interfering in an election. And I certainly think that Trump and his cronies should be held accountable for their crimes, especially their financial crimes. But there is no doubt that the conversation about Russia became a way for a national security establishment, essentially, to rehabilitate themselves right. through really the only thing they have to offer, which is a kind of old Cold War nostalgia that just doesn't make sense anymore in the context of our very different ideological and political climate. I mean, no matter what you you want to say about comparing Russia and the Soviet Union, first of all, these are very different political communities. Like, the Russia is a right-wing, increasingly in many ways, like ethno-nationalist state that just isn't at all tied to the ideology of that, that past historical moment. But even beyond that, beyond the ways in which this is like a kind of nostalgia for a path that doesn't make sense, it's allowed these folks to claim a patriotic and moral high ground where you have people like James Clapper that, you know, gets to say that Trump is a Russian asset. You know, I'm the voice of reasonable foreign policy. This is the same man, you know, not that long ago, four years ago, um, that was lying to Congress about the fact that he was supervising War, mass world and surveillance of Americans. And now he's been rehabilitated as a hero. Mueller, you wouldn't get any sense from watching MSNBC or reading The New Yorker, where he's presented as basically like the world's greatest lawyer and this upstanding figure of law and order, that when he ran the FBI after 9-11, he was a person that was effectively in charge of pent bomb, the investigation into the events of 9-11. And, you know, that's when the FBI rounded up over 5,000 Muslims without, you know, without suspicion. And many of those Muslims ended up facing prison beatings and abuse. And he was a named defendant when those same folks ended up suing the government for their mistreatment. Right. And Um, now he's Elliot Ness. Exactly. It's a very. So, again, this is not to say that we shouldn't have the investigation. The investigation is important. But because we didn't have any pre-existing debate about, well, what kind of national security policy should we have and how should we think of what the U.S. has done really post, let's say, um, the 9-11, but going further back. It's meant that today on the news, if an old, if a Wall Street banker comes out and is like attempting to claim the mantle of the resistance, I mean, that's almost laughable because of the way that the Sanders wing of the party has placed the economy on the stage. But that, that's that equivalent move has not been made with all of these folks who are really deeply implicated in some of the most destructive acts of American violence in the last two decades. And I think it comes down to the fact that there is a legacy, you know, and you may have to go back uh, sometime, but there is a legacy in the Democratic Party and uh, and certainly on the left, broadly speaking, that um, uh, of economic populism uh, of uh, suspicion of you know uh, concentrated wealth there is a legacy of that it's it went away for a little bit but 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 it's there it just doesn't seem to be 
encoded in the DNA of of the left of the Democratic Party when it comes to uh, any type of foreign policy. So um, with that said, and let's assume we had the moment of reckoning, and I think there's more opportunity now because of, you know, uh, really the reasons that you covered in that first piece uh, about the decline of, uh, you know, about our ending this sort of post-Cold or entering this post-Cold uh, War era. Um what what should those uh, on what grounds should they should should those principles be developed? And, and let me just and as you go into this, I, I mean, I know what you've written in your piece, but I'm also struck that when I think of the most significant voice on who 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 has articulated not necessarily broad principles, although maybe he has, but seems to be operating from some broad principles Ironically, it is a guy like Chris Murphy, who is not associated with this more economic populist movement, you know, this more democratic socialist. I mean, I, I don't want to say the Kamala Harris or the, the Kristen Gillibrand or, or Cory Booker are of these people. But, you know, they're going out and making proposals that are consistent with that on the other side. And, and you bring up this point, like, you know, if you're not for Medicare for all, uh, you're almost immediately uh, dismissed from the, the the top tier of consideration of democratic uh, leadership at this point. Um, Chris Murphy is a guy who sort of like you know hedges on that stuff, but seems to articulate a foreign policy that is um, well thought out and aggressive and aggressively um, non interventionist in some ways. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I I think that it's really important, and so Murphy in a way you're presenting as a bit of like a, a flip of, let's say, somebody like um, uh, Cory Booker or some some of the folks that are kind of claiming <clears throat> a more economically populist uh, move, whether or not they're actually like authentically committed right. to those issues right. is another question. But, you know, to me, this speaks to the, the big problem, which is really the problem in a way since the late 40s, which is just s- separating the two. The fact that these two are thought of as distinct pots, democ- uh, domestic and foreign. And so you can have a set of views in one that don't necessarily translate to the other and vice versa without recognizing, especially because of the fact that the U.S. is s- such a globally dominant power, that the two are, are necessarily intertwined. And the kinds of foreign policy that the U.S. pursues ends up shaping the terms of domestic politics and vice versa. Um, and that's why you know I actually think that, you know, it's, it's been one of the great, I think, limitations of progressive politics in this country um, for the better part of 70 years. And it's something that has to be confronted if you're, even if you're just seriously focused on questions like, like Medicare for all. And that's why, you know, I, I tried to kind of work through some basic principles and maybe through the principles we can talk a little bit about why I think you have to take seriously the foreign to have any account that's coherent of the domestic. Yes, please. Yeah, so t- to me, like, it all begins with just recognizing that the U.S. is an imperial power. The U.S. is in a globally dominant position, and the kind of background assumption that's marked both parties is not just that this is good, but that the U.S., should have primacy, and it should have this kind of primacy because its interests are the world's interests, its national security objectives are the equivalent of human rights or humanitarian objectives. There's no difference between its interests and, like, you know, world moral ends. And for that reason, it has a right to intervene continuously everywhere, and it also has a right to engage in sort of selective enforcement and withdrawal from international obligations. It can move in and out of international obligations. It can exercise unilateral force. It can act exceptionally because it's the exceptional backstop. And this has had lots of different corrosive effects. And to to respond to it, you need to begin with the premise that American foreign policy has to be committed to a a non-imperial approach that refuses to treat other societies as sort of instrumental to our own security ends, and that takes seriously the value of self-determination. And that, to me, ends up emphasizing a few different principles. One principle is social democracy. Another one is about how we use force and a focus on um, do no harm and taking seriously force as the last rather than the first option. And a final one is 
moving toward a very different approach to the national security infrastructure and figuring out ways, just as we're confronting the carceral state, to confront the national security state. So, you know, I think global social democracy is a good way of thinking about the current limitations of the Democratic Party on foreign policy and how the foreign and domestic are really linked, if, if you want to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, I, and, and I also want to talk about sort of like how um, w- we do particularly the how you fight the national security apparatus, like from a practical standpoint. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, to me, like the um, I mean, maybe we should just get to the first part first and then we can get to that uh, uh, second. Sure. We, and we might also want to spend a little bit of time um talking about force and the use of force because the constant criticism is hey none of this works because it means that you're a pacifist like you don't believe in force which is um a straw man argument that's used to justify really bad policies okay but uh, talk about that first part about the 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 global social yes exactly yeah yeah so um you know one way i think of thinking a little bit about uh the global social democracy point was the debate that that was there but not fully fleshed out around TPP and around trade that we're seeing now with Trump, which is the way that the conversation was had was that treaties like it, the like TPP or like a, a regional agreements and, and multilateral agreements like, um, like, like TPP, um, it's really about protectionism and trade and tariffs. But that's just not the right way to think about it. And there's a great scholar named David Graywall who's been writing about this for the last few years, which is, you know, take TPP. Less than 10 of the 30 sections had anything to do with tariffs. The vast majority of the sections really had to do with transnational corporate uh, property rights of corporations. In other words, what these agreements are about is creating a simple and unified regulatory arena within which global capital can move and corporations can pursue their their own ends. And you see this explicitly with the provisions for something called investor state dispute settlements. Yes, and we've talked give, about this on yeah, the program. It basically so, creates a sort of an embedded uh, corporate regulatory structure where the corporation's uh, expectations of profits and ability to make profits supersede the ability of each sovereign state to uh, regulate, create uh, labor regulations or environmental regulations or consumer protections that would in any way inhibit the corporate expectations of of these multinational co- uh, companies. Yeah, so uh, th- this is uh, the key point, I mean, which is that creating a common regulatory arena that allows capital to flow, you know, essentially undermines the ability of the state. That means of, of publics and democratic communities to be able to make decisions about labor, about health, about the environment. And, you know, when you have a, a party that on the one hand is pursuing those kinds of policies, which is what like the Obama administration is doing the second, second term, while at the same time claiming domestically that, well, actually it's interested in preserving elements of the the welfare state, what it's doing is it's essentially undermining the capacity of of movement actors and labor, of ordinary people to to impose on a global scale as well as within their their own communities these particular kinds of social democratic ends. And, you know, we see this now. So Trump is railing about trade deals. But again, like this is not a question about trade. If Trump were to revise NAFTA, what Trump would do is maybe, you know, pursue various kinds of protectionism, but the policy would again be to to create a common regulatory arena that allows transnational property rights um, to, to run roughshod over various kinds of democratic accountability. Um, and taking seriously the principle of social democracy means having an account of the global economy that challenges um, the various ways in which our current global economy is built on global mobility and the limitation of labor and publics to be able to control that. And you see it in lots of uh, other settings as well. I mean, this is a moment, I'll give one last example, where everybody is kind of um, talking about how wonderful like Macron is, how great um, somebody like um, Angela Merkel is in Germany. 
um, because of the ways in which they're attempting to contest in different forms, like the politics of, of Trump. But let's be honest, what France and especially Germany have done in Europe through their own EU policy is pursue uh, a politics of austerity that's really starved the, 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 the state, domestic state capacity to, um, to impose health and labor and educational and a variety of other kinds of public goods. And this means that we have to be really hesitant about throwing our arms around figures that are actually backing the kinds of economic policies that make it harder within the U.S. to pursue uh, various kinds of social democratic goals. And we have to think about ways to actually connect to the same anti-austerity forces in Europe and elsewhere that are attempting to contest the spread of global capital. Why does it make it harder uh, in the U.S.? I mean, we've we've been through a period where um, Europe had pretty extensive austerity, the U.S. less so. Why does it make it harder? So, I mean, I, the, there are a few different ways. I think the most most obvious example would just be that the stronger the position of, of let's say, business relative to, the stronger the position of business relative to labor, the stronger its own resources are when it comes to questions about wages, benefits, and bargaining. That bargaining between labor and business is really, you know, deeply conflictual. It's about conflicting interests, and it's predicated on how much power each side can bring to the table. And if you have background regional arrangements and global arrangements that strengthen the hand of capital to move from one location to another, to find regulatory arenas that are best for its own interests, this produces a race to the bottom everywhere, right. and it makes it much more difficult for labor activists to press for, for their own ends domestically because they're always threatened with the possibility of companies picking up and leaving. Right. And then the way that you respond to that is the way that somebody like Trump does, which is by just creating sweetheart deals for the companies so that they're basically in a win-win situation. They make the money if they leave, and then they can essentially hold the, the government hostage if they want to stay. And that's a kind of spiral down that's marked the last 40 years and has really hurt the position of working people in this country. All right. Let's talk about uh, about use of force, because um, uh, w that's obviously, um, you know, a, a big question. And it's used as a bludgeon in many respects to uh, address uh, any type of left critique of, of, of what we do. Yeah, I mean, so. My own position, just as a beginning point, is I am not a pacifist. And there's a way in which if you critique American intervention, the response basically is like, well, you're some kind of Pollyannish person that just thinks that like the people's better natures will somehow win out if you talk to them enough. Um, and that's an absolute uh, straw man argument that gets trotted out because you just don't hear left voices on mainstream news discussing what alternatives might be. My own view is that there's absolutely legitimate times to use force, either by communities that are oppressed, so anti-colonial armed resistance, um, or even by the, the U.S. state itself. You know, a supporter of uh, World War II, obviously that would be an appropriate time to engage in the use of force. Um, I support um, certain kinds of limited humanitarian interventions uh, if forces the last resort, and it's clear that it's the, the only solution. Um, so, for example, in Rwanda. But what's happened is that those two examples in particular, World War II and then Rwanda more recently, have been transformed into almost like universal um, test cases that highlight the fact that American, American power is necessarily good and that the U.S. has to use Ameri has to use force because if it doesn't, um, the world is going to face moral instability. How do I mean? Because this is the dilemma that I had in terms of of Libya. I was supportive of the mandate from the from the U.N. as far as it went, which was to prevent to protect the people of Benghazi. The U.N. Security Council had determined that there was an imminent threat of, of essentially genocide of the people in Benghazi. Um, NATO, uh, more or less NATO forces, um, uh, overstepped that, that, that mandate, and it ended up 
basically screwing the pooch, I think, in the Security Council for anything else similar to that. But on its terms, aside from the the potential of of it of the of mandates being superseded, how do you determine? Like, how do you? Okay, we can say in retrospect Rwanda, but how do you in real time make that assessment and make it in such a way that it doesn't allow for a a broadening of the mandate? Maybe not even necessarily in Rwanda, but but more generally, as he's talking about. Yeah. So. I- so to me, I think that the, where you start has to be from a position of what I, I describe in the paper as, or in the, the essay as, do no harm. In other words, the presumption can't be that to do something is necessarily to use violence in all its forms from sanctions all the way to troop, uh, boots on the ground. But it has to begin from the idea that, well, violence is a really extreme weapon and it should only be used under circumstances in which it truly is the best way of serving the needs of local communities. And in particular, in the context of conflicts, their humanitarian needs of just sort of like basic peace, safety, and, you know, uh, 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 fundamental public goods like food, shelter, etc. And that perspective, I think, if you begin from caution rather than the idea that the only option on the table is force, and if you're not using force, you're doing nothing, allows you to kind of parse what's going on. So I posed the intervention in Libya from the beginning, and this is the reason, which is, so I might have, I have my own issues with responsibility to protect as an overarching legal frame, but even within the idea of responsibility to protect that's emerged, force is supposed to be the last tool that's applied. And what basically happened with the construction of the UN security resolution and the way that it ended up being pursued by um, the NATO allies in the US was that it was essentially like the first tool and it was the first tool in a complicated domestic power struggle between Gaddafi and a variety of different actors that had emerged out of a legitimate popular uprising but it had emerged out of a popular uprising after somebody like Gaddafi had seen what might happen um, in the context of other uprisings right. in Tunisia or Egypt. And what this meant was that the, you have a complex situation on the ground, you have an immediate resort to force, and you have a policy decision domestically in the US that one of the benefits of getting rid of Gaddafi is that, well, here's an opportunity to remove a figure that's a that's, you know, a marginally opposed figure within our own, the U.S.'s own regional alliances, where the U.S. has basically at that point been on the wrong side of a lot of different um, Arab uprisings. It had backed basically Mubarak, so it was on the wrong side in Egypt. It was on the wrong side in um, Bahrain. It's on the wrong side in Yemen. And it meant that we were already essentially on the ground throwing our weight um, behind actors um, that it was really unclear the extent to which they had domestic support. And so humanitarian ends and national security objectives were combining in ways that were really deeply problematic and, and tells a kind of longer story where the, the, the thought is that these two things are aligned, but the local experience oftentimes is that what their own, what like local domestic goals aren't consistent with the kind of strategic ends that the U.S. might have about shifting who's in power. So, so and what this meant? Go ahead. So, from a practical standpoint, that national security resolution, or the the UN security resolution, the first one should have been, we'll we'll drop uh, two hundred million dollars worth of gold uh, on uh, on on Gaddafi's. Um, palace as a way of getting him and we should have had a well, series of I, I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, yeah. facetious but w- we should have had a series of other attempts to uh to 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 save those people in benghazi before it's uh, jets yes so that there should be a series of steps before you get to to violence and one of those steps and it might not work but one of those steps has to be an inclusive diplomatic process that brings all of the relevant actors to the table to see if there can be some kind of transition. Um, And none of that was actually applied. And instead, what the U.S. did is it didn't just pursue jets, but what the policy ended up being, and this is totally inconsistent with the humanitarian end of of 1793, the the resolution, the policy ended up being, you know, firing on Kadhafi. Can you hear me? Yes. 
the policy ended up being firing on Gaddafi soldiers even when they were retreating. Right. And it meant that by the conservative estimates of the transitional government, so, you know, our allies that ended up taking over afterwards, somewhere between 30 and 50,000 people were killed in a humanitarian intervention. And that's, and that's not even getting to what ends up happening later, which is we had no reconstruction plan. The sovereign wealth of Libya ended up being frozen uh, in bank accounts in, in southern Europe. And the country absolutely fractured and collapsed because at the end of the day, really, it was the security imperatives rather than the humanitarian concerns that were driving the policy. Now, it might be the case that if you start from, well, okay, let's figure out about how to engage in an inclusive diplomatic process and pursue something like managed transition, bring the various parties to the table, that you're still going to have violence and that you might end up having social conflict. Um, but it's certainly the case that the violence that was wrought on Libya that ended up now generating a massive refugee crisis, um, uh, you know, was hardly the, the only the only policy that could have been pursued. All right. Well, uh, Aziz, we, we don't have um, much time left, but um, I do want to just touch on this one more point that about about uh, fighting the national security apparatus, like from a, on a practical standpoint. And it seems to me the 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 really the only way to do that in the sort of the short to midterm if a if someone who had you know if we had this reckoning and there was a development of these principles that people could sign on to which i think could happen actually fairly quickly um you know there there could be um a an elizabeth warren or a bernie sanders of foreign policy uh who is integrated you know, uh, these these concepts um, and, or maybe it's Bernie Sanders. Um, and uh, but from a practical standpoint, it seems to me the way to do this is to just to expand the diplomatic corps, <laughs> like like literally do it with just bodies uh, so that there is some uh, manifestation resources to rival the resources of the national security state within the, the broader bureaucracy, just so that those voices win out in some fashion. So I, I think, I mean, I, so I think that this is certainly important. There needs to be resources put to diplomacy and to reverse like the decades long degrading of diplomacy as an approach to interacting with the world. But it has to be still within the context of a critique of the security state. And the reason why I say that is because there's a really simple way, and fr frankly, I think you see some of this in the, the conversations about Rowan Farrow's new book, yep. where the defense of diplomacy can just be, hey, this is a defense of soft rather than hard power. So it's just a defense of, well, you know, we can better pursue American international police power by using the carrot rather than the stick. Um, and this can actually kind of facilitate and entrench some of the policies that that I personally would find pretty problematic. So right. you have to defend diplomacy, but within a reorientation, like defending diplomacy by saying, you know, all these past secretaries of state think we should have more, um, you, you know, more diplomats. That's not a reorientation. And there are two ways I think to tie to to practically ground a reorientation. One, and this ties to the do no harm point, but is also really about the national security state. Is the national security state has been marked, you know, from the Cold War um, by legal impunity. And that's, that, that's something that's really especially defined this post 9-11 period where, you know, so some of this is about politics. You, the, the same folks come back to power under the Obama administration is back to the fact that Obama is supposed to be the anti-war candidate. But some of this is just about people are not held accountable for violations of law and the U.S. treats its own domestic and international legal um, uh, legal limitations when it comes to uh, national security as basically like choices. I think all we that's need to say is Gina Haspel may very well be the head of the, the, the our CIA. I mean, that's absolutely right. That's, so there has to be legal accountability for people that engage in violence. And that accountability has to apply as well to our allies. Right. You know, that. I think, so I mentioned this, uh, I didn't mention it in the piece, but like it's a natural follow-up of the piece. I think it's a huge problem that our, you know, our closest allies, certainly in the Middle East, one of our closest allies, period, um, Israel. So we have 
uh, army snipers that are killing unarmed protesters. And there's absolute silence except for Bernie Sanders yep. on, you know, on that behavior. Now, irrespective of what you think about U.S.-Israel policy, at the very least, we have to hold accountable to basic legal principles right. actors that are so closely tied to our own interests. So there's one issue, which is legal legal accountability and and an end to impunity. And I think that this is a broad thing. And again, it's not just a foreign policy point. It's a, dom- it's a domestic policy point as well, because it's... The, you could apply that to Steve Mnuchin. You, you could apply exactly. that to a whole host. Of, yes. The, there's the, the oligarchy economically and the national security state um, both enjoy a kind of impunity to crime that has to be rejected. That's a simple point, regardless of whether or not we're engaged in you know, r- radical reconstruction. And right. then the, the last thing is, I think the weak links in the security state um, need to be confronted and demobilized. So like the weakest link right now, I think, is the Department of Homeland Security because of the way in which it intersects with immigration, which is another policy, uh, policy area that really highlights the ties between domestic and foreign, that if it's clear you have institutions like ICE um, that are, are imposing violence on, on, on individuals and that you know, use the border essentially as a tool for pursuing a harsh and, and frankly like racist way of thinking about American politics, then you got to confront it. And we can have a conversation about, well, do we need, I mean, ICE, Department of Homeland Security, these are recent historical creations. They're post 9-11 institutional developments. And, you know, frankly, confronting them is a very simple way of, of beginning the conversation about unspooling a number of different institutions that have emerged. Well, Aziz Arana, the piece is The Left's Missing Foreign Policy. It's in N Plus One magazine. Uh, We will put a link to it at majority.fm. Thank you so much. Uh, Really fascinating stuff. My pleasure as always. Aziz Rana, folks. Um, All right. So here's the deal. Uh, We are we're going to end the show uh, early today because uh, we're we're literally taking stuff down almost as I'm speaking. In fact, as I'm speaking, as you're hearing me, we're hopefully we're pretty darn close to taking it down. Uh, but as I speak at the moment, um, things are falling down all around me, right outside the frame here. You can't even be aware of it, but there are, we have uh, about 43 people here in the office working, uh, major cranes and a forklift and a skid steer. Jamie made sure that they're paid a union wage. Yes, we got 43. It's very expensive, you guys. It's very, yeah, so we don't have time to waste. I really actually got to wrap this up. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. Tomorrow, Stacy Mitchell on, um, on Amazon as a monopoly and six things we can do to get rid of the toxic monopolies that are I mean, they're harming. I mean, the big thing is wealth inequality um, and they're making our economy just less durable in general. All that and more uh, tomorrow. Don't forget, join the majority dot com. Just coffee dot co-op, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority. Get 10 percent off. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow. I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot Choice was made for the option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess I may have lost my drive between the 101 and the 5. Do you know how far the detour takes you? Yeah, I know the clock is ticking. But the man's are-